giving to God's work. Now, we give because God told us to, but he told us to in the New Testament, not just the Old Testament. It's very interesting as we begin to study today from this particular passage in 2 Corinthians. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Him. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, taking you through the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. All in one year. Very exciting. Corey is here. Corey, what's up? I'm looking at an artifact called the Nazareth inscription. Uh, I love this Nazareth inscription. I know that one. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. And what did you study? Today we're going to talk about the indescribable gift. All right, very good. Also, Ryan is here. Ryan, what's up? Today I'm studying that famous suffering servant passage in Isaiah chapters 52 and 53. There's been some interesting discoveries related to this. Very interesting as we begin to study the Bible. That's the world's best selling book and it is the most important book. So get your Bible out and your Bible guide and let's study. Today, you and I are going to be taking a look at an artifact called the Nazareth inscription. Now, this inscription has been known for hundreds of years, for a few hundred years at this point, and it has been studied extensively. It was not found in an archaeological excavation, so it's called an unprovenanced artifact. Uh, it was found on the antiquities market, but it's been studied by many scholars. Take a look. An ancient Greek inscription, today called the Nazareth inscription, may be a response of the Roman Empire to claims of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This marble inscription was bought on the antiquities market in 1878, then acquired by the Paris National Library in 1925, where it finally received scholarly translation and attention. The inscription says, Edict of Caesar, it is my decision concerning graves and tombs, whoever has made them for the religious observances of parents or children or household members, that these remain undisturbed forever. But if anyone legally charges that another person has destroyed or has in any manner extracted those who have been buried or has moved with wicked intent those who have been buried to other places, committing a crime against them, or has moved sealing stones against such a person, I order that a judicial tribunal be created. You are absolutely not to allow anyone to move those who have been entombed, but if someone does, I wish that violator to suffer capital punishment. The scenario described by the inscription seems peculiar for a few reasons. It seems to work well only in a Jewish family tomb scenario. The most common method of Gentile Greek and Roman burials was the internment of cremated remains in individual graves or mausoleums located in cemeteries. There are no known examples of Roman family tombs. Sealing stones were also only used in Jewish family tombs from before AD 70. Also peculiar is the crime being described. Bodies are being moved with malicious intent, not sold or defaced, simply moved. If this inscription was issued in Nazareth, where Jesus was known to be from, before AD 70, that places it in the perfect time and place to be compared with the rapidly growing Christian movement. Christian Jews claimed that Jesus has risen from the dead and pointed to his empty tomb. The high priests, on the other hand, yelled, stolen body. Perhaps Rome responded by clarifying their position, extreme penalties for moving bodies out of their final resting places. So this is a very interesting artifact in terms of, uh, you know, what it means for New Testament history. Was this an official reaction by some of the, the Roman officials in charge of the province of Judea attempting to appease the high priests who were claiming that the disciples of Christ, uh, you know, staged a resurrection? They broke into a family tomb and stole a body. Perhaps it certainly is an intriguing read. Uh, you know, it reads like that. You know, it's talking specifically, uh, it seems, about Jewish family tombs. It fits that context more than it does a Gentile context. Uh, you know, at the very least, if it's not an official response to, which I think the evidence uh, leans on that side, that it, it's, it's more of a Roman response to this burgeoning uh, new Christianity movement, this, this way movement that's, that's 
what's happening and the displeasure of the the priests in Jerusalem over this issue. And the priests and the the priests and the high priests in Jerusalem worked very closely with Roman officials. So you know the evidence seems to lie on that side. Uh, if it's not that at all, then it, it, if it comes earlier, before the resurrection of Jesus Christ, before the trial of Jesus Christ, this at the very least ups the stakes for the disciples because if it comes before this, they would know that the high priests are charging them with a capital offense. Many are willing to give to God's work as they're moved in their heart. But what are they moved by? We must hear what God's word says about supporting his ministry. God doesn't need the resources, but challenges us to give so that they can be supported. These resources help Jesus Christ supply the needs of many. In this world, there are some who starve. About three million of them die every year. There are those who do without, and there are those who steal. God explains in his original law that we will always have the poor with us. And Jesus Christ told us to supply the needs of the poor. Now there are millionaires and there are those who live on three meals a week, some even less, and they need help. When we give to the work of God, we must give to the work of God. Some are called to give offerings. All of us are called to tithe. And the New Testament, the New Testament tells us to give in 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians 9 verses 1 through 15. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that, as I said, you may be ready." lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God, while, through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men, and by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. 
2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 15. I remember on the internet talking with somebody and they told me, well, they don't do anything to give to God anymore because we're not under the, the Old Testament, the old law. And they said, well, I don't give money because I'm not under the old law. That's interesting, you know, because I read it several places in the New Testament. <laughs> and 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is one place where I read it. And it's really interesting because it also talks about God supplying us as we supply the needs for others. He says in verse 10, he says, he who supplies, meaning God, God who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. He says, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, to be generous in every way. I love that, which through us, will produce thanksgiving to God. So it is important for us to recognize that giving is an actual way to worship. It is the way that we worship God. Now, I don't have a problem with giving, and I would encourage people to become a part of giving. And uh, I would simply say that if you want to get your Bible guide and turn to today's page, that's great. But if you don't have a Bible guide, one way you can give is by making a donation in whatever amount God speaks to your heart. We trust the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Whatever amount that is, you can simply give and uh, use the address at the bottom of the screen, or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And when you click on Donate, it'll take you to the web pages that have the Bible Guide on it, and you can get one as well. So this is something that we need to think about. And as we do, let's consider what God says. Giving to God's work. That's the best way to title this. We read 2 Corinthians 7 to 9, looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 to 15. And Father, I pray today that you would help us to hear you. <laughs> help us to understand you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture says, now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians. That Acacia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up majority. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect. That as I said, you may be ready. You may be ready, lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you are unprepared. We, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift, and prepare your generous gift, which you have previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Now that's important. We need to remember that Paul talked to the church at Corinth honestly and openly. They were to give. There's one thing that is the same between Paul's day and us. One thing that is the same, and that is we're in the same age that he was in. Paul understood that the church should give the church should give. When I talk about the church, I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about the people. The church is the people, not the building. Keep in mind that God commands us to give. Now, churches can give as they decide, as people get together and decide as a group they're going to do that. But it is important to remember that the church are the people of God because Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And it doesn't make sense for the head of the church to see some of his people starving over there and some of them gluttoning over there. He said, take some of your food and give it to them. God is practical and God tells us to give to people. Very important. Now we go back to 2 Corinthians 9, 6. It says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who does not give much will not get much. And he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. 
So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, this is important. A cheerful giver is what God loves. We must give to God's work cheerfully. You know, we don't give to God's work and say, I'm going to check on him. I gave my tithe, but I want to make sure that he's doing it right. Because if he's not giving to the ministries I saved, then that's not, hold on a minute, hold on. That's what we need to do. We need to say, God, we give to you. Because when we do give to God, God recognizes that in heaven. Very important. Now look at this. Verse 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you all, having all sufficiency, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance of every good work, as it is written. He has dispersed abroad, and he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also abounding through many thanksgiving to God, while through the proof of this ministry they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ, the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. What is Paul saying? Jesus Christ has supplied and continues to supply his church with everything they need. Do you know something? When you consider that Jesus Christ has supplied all that the church needs, yet there's some parts of the church that are starving. Some parts of the church that are not doing well. Whose problem is that? That's the church's problem. We're not obeying Jesus Christ. That's the reality. And I want to tell you something. It is important for us to obey the Holy Spirit. It is important for us to obey the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit tells us how to give and where to give. And that's why I say to you, we don't tell you what to give. This ministry is a ministry birthed on the giving of God. And I want to say that we don't tell people because the Holy Spirit speaks to them. We trust that. Now, there's some things we have that are basic, but we trust that because God will speak to us, beloved. So we need to think about how this acts in our life. We must be people who give to God. Church leadership is always very interesting. A lot of people are not so sure. We're going to talk about that and more next time on Quick Study Television. It is a good one. Hope to see you there. Ryan? Well, today I'm focusing on Isaiah chapters 52 and 53, specifically from chapter 52, verse 13, all the way to the end of chapter 53. It's here that Isaiah prophesies of the suffering of the coming Messiah. Now, while there are many specific details here which point solely to Jesus Christ as that Messiah, 
Orthodox Jewish scholars strongly reject this. However, rather recent discoveries have helped to positively ID this Messiah. Now, of course, this is controversial, but understand that my role here today is to simply report these findings to you. It's up to you to study further and draw your own conclusion. That being said, let's study. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13 through to chapter 53 is famously known as the Suffering Servant Passage, and it is here that the crucifixion of Israel's future Messiah is portrayed. While the specific details given in this passage regarding this servant clearly identify him as Jesus of Nazareth, Orthodox Jewish scholars reject this. However, since the discovery of the Bible codes, otherwise known as the equidistant letter sequences, or ELS, much has been discovered. One of the most interesting of these discoveries is that virtually every one of the major messianic passages of the Old Testament contains the name Yeshua, that is the Hebrew name of Jesus, encoded within the Hebrew text of the ancient prophecies about the coming of Messiah. One of these occurrences is found in Isaiah 53:10. It says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Who is this servant? Beginning with the second Hebrew letter Yod that occurs in the phrase, He shall prolong, and counting forward from right to left every 20th letter, reveals the phrase, Yeshua Shmi, which translates, Jesus is my name. While this ELS code alone should be enough to verify that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, even more codes were discovered. In fact, more than 40 ELS names of individuals and places associated with the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth have been found within this passage. Indeed, in verse 6 of Isaiah 53, the title Nazarene is encoded in close proximity to the name Yeshua. Galilee is encoded twice. Caiaphas, Annas, Herod, Caesar, Rome, Bread, Wine, Mary, and Joseph are among these as well. Yet probably most startling of all was the discovery that virtually all the names of Jesus' disciples are encoded here as well. Interestingly, a notable omission is Jesus Christ's betrayer, Judas Iscariot, although Judas' replacement, Matthias, is encoded. While these occurrences may not seem very significant on their own and may be attributed to random chance, taken together, this would be virtually impossible. Indeed, there are over 40 relevant names in 15 sentences. It is the density and the relevance to the plain text which would seem to defy attribution to unaided random chance alone. The identity of the Messiah is crystal clear. As fascinating as these discoveries are, even without them, Isaiah is clearly speaking about Jesus of Nazareth, and anyone who's willing to be honest with themselves and others knows this. Our Lord Jesus Christ constantly provides us evidence that He is the Creator God and our Savior. The question is, will we willfully reject that knowledge, or will we accept it? The decision is yours, but know this, if you reject Him, it's certainly not because believing in God is a blind faith. God has revealed himself in a general way through nature and in a specific and special way through the Bible. Now, if you don't have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, I implore you to do so right now. He is alive and he wants to save you. It's really true, Ryan. Thank you for the report. These are good reports. Corey, your reports are excellent as well. Thank you. And uh, I really am grateful to you for all of the things you do for the program. It really is good. Um, let's carry on because this is important. You have something to tell us today. Well, we're talking about the indescribable gift that Paul ends this particular chapter of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And in this part of his letter to the Corinthians, he's talking about giving gifts, administering gifts, and a cheerful giver. And I think it's important for us to understand off the top that giving to a follower of Jesus Christ, so that's any of us who have given our lives to God, we've asked for forgiveness, we have asked the Lord Jesus to come and be a part of our life, to be the Lord of our life, and we follow him. 
our giving should come out of a love for God, first of all, and fl- from that flows love into others. And it shouldn't be out of necessity or begrudgingly. That is not what is meant by a cheerful giver. And so I want to just end by saying that the way Paul ends this in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 15 is thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And some of you might be sitting out there saying, I don't really, I don't really understand what you mean. What is this indescribable gift? What did God give? And that's the reason why we're here. This is the gospel message. This is the good news. We live in a world full of sin. Sin is that thing that separates us from God because God is holy. And that sin has kept us apart. But from the very beginning, God has had a plan. And that plan is to send his son who would pay for the cost of sin with his very own life. But he wouldn't stay dead. He would rise again on the third day to bring us eternal life. And it's not something that we have to pay for. It's a gift that God gives to us. And the only thing that we have to decide is whether to accept that gift or not. And you can imagine that. If it was your birthday and people came over and they had gifts wrapped for you, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, to, to see a beautiful gift sitting there that somebody has given to me, it would seem very not right to not accept that gift and to open it and see what it is. And that's exactly God presents this gift of his son to each one of us, everyone, because everyone has sinned. No one has not sinned, not one. The only one that came was fully God and fully man, and that was Jesus Christ. So he's taken that guilt away. He's taken that separation away. So this is that indescribable gift. And it comes from many verses, but the most famous one, I think, is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved the world so that he gave. And this is the indescribable gift. So we too should always give out of, first of all, our love for God because of what he has given to us. Secondly, because we love God, we love others. So that's why we give. And it should never be just out of obligation. We're missing it if, if that's the reason. That's very good. That is excellent. In fact, you may be sitting there now not really understanding, but you're feeling something in your heart. That's God talking to you. That's the Holy Spirit speaking. And I want to just say that if you invite Jesus Christ into your heart, just pray. You say, what is praying? Praying is talking to God. Just say, talk to God and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I can't do anything about it. And I believe that you came 2,000 years ago and, and we killed you, but you rose from the dead all because you paid the cost of sin and gave us the gift of eternal life. And as a result of that, I invite you into my life to be Lord and King of my life. Come into my heart. I pray today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 